Hello, everyone. Uh, really happy to, to be here today. Um, I'm Ricardo. Uh, today, we'll, we'll be talking about the training and optimization of our transformers. And we'll talk a bit about the, the platforms uh, we have at CERN for this kind of workloads and also uh, a real physics use case for once with a real physicist as well. So I don't have to pretend I know what I'm talking about today. Uh, so, so uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Maxence Draguer. And I am supposed to be the uh, real physicist, but unfortunately, my talk is mostly going to be about uh, how to apply machine learning for a very specific use case in our experiment. Yeah, and I'm Ricardo. I lead the platforms infrastructure team at CERN. I'm also a member of the te technical oversight committee at, uh, at the CNCF and the recently formed end user uh, technical advisory board as well. So. I'll start by giving a very brief overview of what CERN is. Uh, it's the European Organization for Particle Physics. Uh, it's been uh, there for several decades. And uh, the, our flagship project is uh, the Large Hadron Collider, which is a very large uh, particle accelerator that has uh, 27 kilometers in perimeter, and it's uh, 100 meters underground. Uh, we accelerate uh, protons uh, to very close to the speed of light, and we make them collide at specific points where we build these experiments, but because a video is better than a thousand words, I'll try to play this very quickly. So you can see we accelerate two beams of protons on this very large ring. We have these four experiments where we make these collisions. And what I want to highlight here is that these collisions and these machines act as like very large cameras and we produce a lot of data. So I'll stop here uh, because this is where it gets interesting, is that we are generating petabytes of data per second. And traditionally, to handle this on the nanoseconds, we've been building custom electronics that will filter this data, uh, most of this data, the very, very large amount of, uh, of data we are uh, generating, in using custom electronics first, and then the very few percentage that is left, then we use very large computing farms, which traditionally are also CPU-based. Uh, and then from here, we finally get to an amount of data that we can sc store in our data centers and then reprocess and give the physicists for analysis. So this is kind of important to put some context into this talk uh, because uh, it explains uh, a transition that is happening, which is all this custom hardware, all this custom electronics we got used to develop are now possible to be replaced with GPUs and other accelerators and machine learning algorithms. And this is a huge simplification of our infrastructure. So Maxence will talk a little bit about one of the experiments. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm part of the Atlas experiment, and you have a nice uh, photo showing you the scale of the, of the detector with a human uh, just so that's more uh, understandable. Uh, so the point of the ATLAS experiment is to study physics at the fundamental scale, and at the fundamental scales, physics is described by particles, which are um, fundamental elementary elements that you can't subdivide, as far as we know so far. And they're all listed here into the, the circles uh, showing you the different particles. And you have particles that make matter, the outer ring, and then you have particles that make the interactions themselves, uh, the inner rings. And as you can see, there's one at the center, it's the brute Hanglot Higgs boson, or more commonly called just the Higgs boson, or the goddammit particle. So the point of the LHC and ATLAS was to discover this particle, which was done in 2012. But we still have to measure a lot of the properties, and the user case I'm going to show is an advanced use of AI so that we can measure some rare decays of it. And this is obviously a huge collaboration, given just the size of the detector, the size of the data set to see through. So we are about 6,000 members uh, scattered across 260 institutes in more than 40 countries now. And uh, so I'm gonna give you a user case by the end of the, of the talk. Yeah, so now we'll break kind of the talk into two parts. I'll start by talking about infrastructure and, and focus on the journey we had to get here and also the challenges we are facing. And then Maxence will talk about the physics use case at the end. So if we look at what we've been building at CERN and I, we've given many, many talks uh, over the years uh, at this uh, conference and others, uh, we had a long journey to get to where we are. Uh, we started looking at uh, cloud native and Kubernetes back uh, in 2016, where Swarm was also a possibility being considered. We even added Mesos at some point, and we eventually got to um, uh, production service. And then all the work we've been doing since then is about integration with our internal systems. So things like storage and our Ceph systems and other storage systems we have in-house. And then usability and uh, ease of deployment with GitOps, secret management, things like Flux and Argo. 
uh, then allowing heterogeneous clusters with node groups, auto-scaling, auto-healing, load balancers, and then a very strong focus on dissemination uh, internally, mostly to get people used to handle these kind of applications, and also security, uh, which is uh, something we put a lot of focus on. And finally, uh, one key, key aspect is uh, ensuring uh, business continuity and disaster recovery, and we've been building on all the features that have been offered by, by our tools. So this has been a long journey, but it got us to, to quite far. And uh, you can see here we use uh, these tools, but a lot more. Uh, but from, from the top, you can see the webinars we organize internally. And you see two different kinds of things we are offering. You can see the services. Uh, so here at the top, you have uh, how CERN runs critical application servers on Kubernetes. And this is really the critical systems on the campus. Uh, the everyday uh, services we need to support a campus with uh, 10,000 people. Uh, and then we also see the other side, which is more the physics analysis. And you can see here analysis reproducibility with Rihanna and Kubernetes. This is where uh, the physics actually happens. And then the base computing power we need. Uh, Ruccio here, moving Ruccio to production in Kubernetes. Ruccio is the system that is responsible for, in the Atlas experiment, moving data around. And these are pretty large uh, uh, requirements. So if we look at Ruccio, for example, I have two, plot, two plots uh, on the top there. You can see we are, any random week at CERN, we are moving over 50 petabytes of data around. And you can see transferring of seven petabytes of, uh, of data as well. And then on the capacity, you can see here an experiment that was done by the uh, Atlas uh, experiment using public clouds, where they tried to scale out to, the, to, in this case, GCP. And they managed to run for several days with over 80,000 cores of uh, spot instances. So we have a lot of um, experience. We've built all this infrastructure that people got used to. So when we start looking at machine learning and AI, it's only obvious to try to build on it. And we started looking, and Kubeflow was, was a good option. Uh, it builds on all the principles we, we had uh, uh, in-house already. It kind of doesn't build anything new. It, get, it gets a lot of uh, components working together in a way that uh, can help the end users. And it's, uh, it's been uh, quite successful in answering all our needs, which is things from data preparation to some sort of fast iteration using notebooks or other means, then scaling out to distributed training and hyperparameter optimization, and then model storage and serving. I won't go into details on this, but you have the QR code of previous talks that we gave in this area. So what I will focus is uh, we have this infrastructure. Uh, what are the challenges that we have today? And these are challenges that are both on the stack, but also on the usage of, of, the, of the resources. So the first, the first uh, challenge we have, and I don't know how many people are running their on-premises infrastructure or just relying on, on external uh, cloud providers, but if you're running your infrastructure, at least for us, this has been a huge challenge. The pattern of usage of, uh, of this hardware is very different from what we call our traditional CPU workloads. Uh, the needs for power and for cooling increase dramatically. If we look at this plot here, we can see that the needs for power in the current generations, but sp especially if we look at the future generations that are coming, uh, kind of limit a lot the density we can have. And at the same time, uh, people are, you are requesting this, this kind of uh, density. Uh, not only the density in a single node, but they are also asking for things that were traditionally only needed by a HPC uh, centers and supercomputers, things like fast, fast network inter interconnects, infinite band and friends. All of this comes with a huge uh, request for power and cooling. So if we look at that diagram there, we can see if we have four GPUs per node with uh, interconnects internally, we are already putting quite a lot of uh, demand on the power uh, and cooling required for each rack. If we start talking about fast interconnects between the nodes, then things get even more complicated. The second one is hardware evolution, and this doesn't seem like it's uh, uh, calming down. Uh, we got used to a uh, sort of stable increase in terms of uh, um, evolution of hardware around CPUs. Uh, but suddenly we, we started having uh, GPUs coming into the scene and uh, the rate of uh, increase is much higher. So we can see here the predicted uh, the next generations for NVIDIA. 
uh, and we see what they are optimizing for. So they are clearly targeting uh, things like LLMs, which are not necessarily the main use cases we have internally for machine learning. But what this means is that people are following the trend. When technology allows you to do something, you start building new use cases. And this is what we are seeing in-house. The fact that you can have such large models uh, in, in a GPU and such power in a single GPU means that people are considering what I was showing at the beginning of having this custom electronics for, for the very fast uh, uh, filtering in the detectors. This can now be replaced potentially by uh, uh, more commodity hardware uh, with GPUs and other accelerators. So these use cases are coming. At the same time, people will want to have the new fancy uh, GPUs from our side, because they are extremely expensive, we want to make them last longer. So we are already pushing the lifetime of this kind of hardware from five years, which is our standard, to eight years, while people want to have a much faster turnaround because this is what the public cloud providers are giving them. And then what this means is that we have to make the best of our internal infrastructure, but we also want to uh, offer the, the more advanced use cases, the hardware they need. So. Uh, what this means is that we probably, or we are going hybrid, clearly, and this is to fit both uh, the needs, but also the costs for these specific use cases and the very large delivery times we are facing today. And we could say this will be a hype that disappears, but we already saw this with Bitcoin, and now we have another hype. Maybe there will be a new, a new one, so it doesn't seem like this kind of uh, infrastructure is going away. Uh, going hybrid brings a lot of new challenges, and the, luckily we have some, quite some experience with this. Uh, the, the challenges, uh, the, needs, the new needs and requirements for network and storage. Uh, over the last 20 years, we built something that you can see there on the top right, which is the grid computing infrastructure for the LHC. These are 200 different centers around the world that we connected with very high uh, throughput links. So we know how to distribute the data, we know how to do the workload scheduling to put the workloads where the data is or move the data when appropriate. If we look at the cloud native stack though, there are things that are missing. We don't have the primitives yet completely there for advanced scheduling, things like queues, things like co-scheduling, and we, have, we don't have an easy way to handle multi-cluster. The management of multi-cluster is there the scheduling across multi-cluster is not there. So this is something I find extremely interesting to focus on right now. Projects like Q and uh, the new features they've been adding around multi Q are really interesting. And if you look at other projects like Volcano or Armada, I can see that they will start building on, the, on, on this base layer as well. What is really interesting here is that if we solve this problem, and we are focusing on this mostly because of uh, Gen AI, uh, we are actually going to solve uh, a lot of problems for HPC centers that have been using traditional tools like Slurm for scheduling, and suddenly they start being able maybe to offer a, a pure cloud native uh, API to their users. This is a huge simplification, and for us this would mean that we can use the same API on-premises public cloud providers and uh, targeting HPC centers as well. So this is uh, something that will be very interesting to follow in the next year or so. And the last one I have, and this is came while discussing with Maxence for this talk, is that we probably need to start focusing on the Python for our C++ infrastructure. If you have anything ever to do with high energy physics, you probably heard of the root framework, which is a data analysis framework developed at CERN. It's written in C++. And there's a lot of people that are expert in C++ that love it and wouldn't change C++ for anything else. But there's a lot of other people that do not want to handle the complexity of C++. So there's a layer called PyRoot that kind of simplifies the, the, the life of a data, uh, data physics analysis uh, physicist uh, quite, quite a lot. So when we start looking at our, our, our uh, uh, stack, we, we, we see constantly when we offer uh, tools like Kubeflow that people say, okay, my job is pending, I have no idea what that means. I don't know how to debug it. I run the kubectl command that is in the documentation, but I really don't know what I'm doing. So maybe the abstraction is, is, an abstraction is required to kind of bridge this gap. Uh, and then also for HPC, there's this, uh, this lack of knowledge to answer HPC questions. When you're running very large uh, workloads on a kind of batch-like way, there are things that you want answered uh, 
to, to be able to do your job properly. Things like, how long is my workload going to take to complete? Or when will re resources be available for my workload to run? The Cloud Native Stack wasn't necessarily designed for this kind of workloads, batch workloads. It was more for the ser service-oriented uh, type of uh, workloads. Uh, and maybe we need to like, take a step back and see what primitives we're missing to be able to answer these kind of questions. And with this, I pass to Maxons to continue with uh, like a real use case. All right. Um, so, yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. So, go to the use case. So, as I mentioned, like one of the things we're really interested in Atlas is to find Higgs boson. And uh, you have a nice um, visualization of such an event in Atlas. This is a real event in which you can see one fundamental particle called a muon. Uh, that is emanated from the main event. And also you can distinguish these two bluish cones, which are more visible on this side, which is a Higgs boson decaying to two types of quarks called Bs. And we want to be able to identify these quarks. In our detector, you can see that this leaves a very complicated signature, definitely impossible to analyze humanly. So we do need uh, data uh, analysis techniques. And what we want to be able to do more specifically is classification of these B quarks versus other types of quarks, which are season light primarily. So, and of course we want to do that because we want to study the Higgs because in the end this is a physics experiment and we want to make conclusions on the theory. The best way to find these uh, B quarks, B jets, is to use machine learning for the, because they give the best accuracy, obviously. And obviously to get the best accuracy, you need the best performing machine learning model. So you need to optimize your hyperparameters, which is very costly. And this talk is, this part of the talk really is about this. It's about a framework to improve the hyperparameter optimization using kubeflow and a, a technique from the literature. So on our side, we've been not only uh, focusing on the hyperparameters, of course, we've also been trying other architecture. And I'm just showing this plot so that you have a bit of a, an idea of the history of, our, of the project. So uh, we're doing B versus C versus L classification, which every time they quarks. And you can see how the model's performance evolves through the year. So this is at the phi B efficiency, identification efficiency. It's showing you in green the C rejection and in blue the light rejection, where the rejection is the inverse of the misclassification efficiency. And you can see that through the years, adopting more advanced machine learning uh, from like a deep neural network to including a recurrent neural network to using a deep set based architecture, using graph attention, and finally using GN2 uh, which is a transformer-based model I'm going to mostly talk about. Uh, we managed to have this really nice improvement in, um, in performance. And this is very important for us because these are very difficult and rare events to find. So we're literally sifting through uh, to find like the needle in the haystack, even though the haystack is much bigger. And all of these models are trained in a similar way. They use combined type of inputs, which combines different types of physics inputs, so that they can output the probability for each for a jet to be of each quark. And then we use this, we, we build discriminant based on this core that later on uh, an analysis can use to uh, you know, do the data analysis. They all trained on Monte Carlo simulated data, but they calibrated on real data to account for some mismodeling effects there. And uh, so the model I'm gonna focus on is this GN2 model, which is a transformer based uh, model, which we could describe as a multimodal multitask uh, model. It's multi-model in the physics sense that it combines different types of physics input, uh, which for us is kind of nice because it combines very things we use historically to treat in very different ways. We used to have a one network that would deal with one type of information and another network that would build, you know, use another one. And the nice thing with this single architecture that is combining the different type of input, uh, it's much simpler to maintain and upgrade and uh, do studies such as hyperparameter optimization or when we change the entire software stack to reconstruct several uh, sub-elements. And it gives us this simplicity with the state-of-the-art performance. So really uh, the usual trend in, uh, I think, in machine learning to have one large, huge network able to do several stuff at once. And really able to do several stuff at once because it's multitask. And you can see this from the fact it's not just predicting uh, the flavor, so the class. It's also uh, predicting um, other physics, uh, physically relevant uh, information that we know from expert knowledge. So it's a way to put expert knowledge into the design. And it's working really well with the only caveat that it's quite resource intensive for us to train. It takes us roughly two to three A100 GPUs an entire week of training uh, to do one full training due to the size of the data set mostly. 
And the problem is we are not a uh, large tech company, and most people in our collaboration do not have access to a high-performance cluster with the sufficient amount of GPUs to be able to contribute to this sort of project. It also makes it prohibitively large for us to do hyperparameter optimization, uh, just given the scale of one training and the fact that you have to iterate. Um, so really this talk is about you know, how we could democratize this. And obviously, this is the Kubeflow conference, so we thought that this would be like a nice way to do this for several reasons. So first, the nice reason is that this uh, um, you know, container orchestration engine characteristic of Kubeflow uh, is quite suitable with our framework. We, we always uh, keep our code on a GitLab repository, and it's quite already well uh, adopted to, to, to make them build, build, buildable into executable images. Um, so using um, the, 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 the CI, um, the continuous integration tools of uh, GitLab. So for us, it's very easy to integrate this with uh, this uh, KTIP framework, in this case, because it's about hyperparameter optimization uh, that is provided by CERN uh, in this, um, th this website here, which is uh, this server that's installed with Kubeflow. And on our side, more specifically, so we just have our code on the GitLab, which is executable, and we have our data accessible through an S3-like data storage that we can mount uh, more locally so that when we train, uh, the, the speed of loading in the input output is, uh, is higher. And um, one thing we really like with this approach is that we can actually use your guys' work, which means that we get, for example, access to auto machine learning algorithms, which we normally not use. Uh, so it really gives us uh, easily access to a lot of uh, development in this area. And I just want to highlight like, uh, what we think are the key points that really makes it interesting for us. Uh, so first of all, it's this open source and active community that really continuously develop these tools, which means that we don't have to do it ourselves, which is not our expertise uh, on, on the Atlas side, but more about expertise in, on the sand side, of course. Uh, for us, it's reviewed as a multi-platform and very flexible framework, meaning that we don't really, we're not really so dependent on one uh, server. We could really move if we need to, to a private cloud uh, provider, uh, if we need to massively scale suddenly and you know, for a single one-off project. Uh, so really, it gives us an optimized resource usage. Also, it means that we could more easily share hardware resource with the other experiment, because at the moment, the thing is quite fragmented, and uh, we do not work with other experiments to share hardware, uh, which is not ideal, because we would like to have huge GPU clusters and uh, it would be easier if we were to share them uh, with the other experiments. And again, one strong point for us is that it's accessible to everyone, so it really democratizes access to machine learning heavy projects in our experiment, and has the nice side benefits of having this cool visualization when you do hyperparameter optimization in KTIP, which you're probably familiar with. All right, but this is not enough, of course, because um, it just, it's a nice framework to run something, but it doesn't mean that the thing you're running is simpler. Uh, you can use all the stopping from uh, uh, hyperparameter optimization, but we still need to reduce the computational uh, complexity so that we're able to do hyperparameter optimization of our transformer. And this is where the talk slightly changes direction and goes into a technique. Because there is a technique in the literature to be able to do the hyperparameter optimization at a lower cost for some of the hyperparameters. And this has to do with the parameterization of the network. And here you have like a classical deep uh, neural network. And what I mean by parameterization really is the way you initialize the weights, so the way you sample them from a random uh, distribution function, uh, in this case Gaussian, but really doesn't quite matter so much. What really matters is that the variance is inversely proportional to the size of the input of the layer. And the learning rate, classically, for all of the weights in the networks are the same um, ever, like the master learning rate. So this would be a standard parameterization, a parameterization a la, a la Lequin. And a, one way to actually uh, move into a, a nicer parameterization for the project I'm going to mention is to adopt this maximal, maximal update parameterization from the literature. And I'm just highlighting the key difference with the standard one. The key difference being that the output layer variance is scaled down by the input dimension of this layer, and the learning rates of the hidden and the output layers are further scaled down too. Um, and this, is, um, this actually makes sense in a way. Like if you think of a network with a specific width, the output layer would be like the more opaque layer as if you were to think of a cross-section of the ocean. The surface is most of the sun, but the bottom really doesn't see so much of the sun. And here the sun would be the, the loss function. 
and uh, yeah, the bottom would be the input layer. So this has the effect of making the output side of the network a bit more transparent so that the uh, learning goes into depth. And um, this is actually uh, provable, and I'm going to go into this uh, later on, but I'm just going to give you uh, like the two key conclusions from this uh, maximum update parameterization. Is it has this effect that uh, the updates of the activations become roughly independent of the size of the width of the layer. So just to clarify, the width is the number of units per layer, uh, so the, really the transversal di dimension, not the depth. And also, it has this nice provable uh, theoretical property that it's the maximal uh, update one, in the sense that it's as big as an update you could get for each layer without leading to instabilities. And uh, there's a way to see this, which is quite cool, and come from uh, this uh, paper on, on the left, uh, which is to take the simplest network you can think of, which is one uh, input, x, has through two layers, an input layer, u, with n dimension, and an output layer V with n dimension 2. So here n would be the width. On the left you have the SPKs and on the right you have the MUPKs. And you can see like some of the key difference, differences at initialization, uh, the way the, they sampled, and also the way the output layer gets updated after one gradient step. And if you look at what this, layer, what, what this network computes, the f of x, after one gradient update, on the SP side you have this nasty term, uh, theta u transpose u, which by the law of large numbers uh, will scale not with the input x, but with the dimension of the layer n. Um, so this means that this would not be width independent in a way. While on the right side, thanks to the modification to the rules of the parameterization, you can see that this term is correctly scaled on by n, so that the scaling is with the input instead of with uh, the dimension. And this can, be vis this can be actually viewed in a network. So this is showing you a GN2-like architecture train for shown at three different time steps. The initialization time step, and one and two training steps. The first row is uh, SP and the second row is MUP. And every time each plot is showing you for different dimensions, um, the sum of the absolute value of the pre-activation weights of the different layers. And each layer is its own curve. And you can see that on, on the SP side, things quickly get unstable after a few um, steps. Of, uh, of learning for very large width. And on the mu piece side, however, things stay stable. So really it scales nicely across width and uh, it's the maximal update in the sense that it stays stable. And um, this actually leads to a few properties that are quite nice and relevant to hyperparameter optimization. The first one is your trainings are stable from the learning rate point of view. So that's actually already quite nice, but also a wider model is always going to be more performant than a less wide one. And that is on the training loss. You may over overfit, but this is a side uh, note I'm not going to touch here. So wider always better, so it also makes you know, architecture search easier. You just take a model that is as wide as you can afford. And finally, and this is the key point here, is that you get similar performance I key across different width, which means that for the MUP side on the left, scanning for one hyperparameter here, which is the maximum value of the learning rate scheduler, and showing the validation loss on the, on the x-axis, you can see that they share the same best hyperparameter. So that's quite nice. That means that if, if you want to be efficient at this, you scan, oh sorry, I should have said, but, so there's three curves, and the yellow one is a transformer with an bending width of width 64, and the red one is width 128, while the purple one is 256. So the thing that's nice with the fact that they all share the same best hyperparameter is that you could use the small one, which is much easier to train, to find the best hyperparameter for the full width one. While on the SP side, you have no such guarantee first, even though in this case it seems to roughly work, but also you get this really unstable behavior when you get a learning rate that's too high, which is again due to the fact uh, the standard parameterization models are not resistant to, uh, the, the, to the width uh, scaling. So this is quite nice actually, and it leads to a algorithm to do uh, the hyperparameter optimization that's uh, come from this paper, which is called MuTransfer, where you just basically do the hyperparameter optimization on the small model, and you directly transfer that to the full model so that you, don't, you, have to, you can avoid like, the complexity of training that several times. And uh, we've tried this in Atlas, and uh, what we've tried is, because we have a required compute limited again, uh, we try to actually optimize two parameters, the maximal uh, learning rate and the initial value of the learning rate scheduler, 
And this is shown here with the same types of plot as the previous slide, just different plots show you different uh, initial value of the learning rate. So it's very efficient for us to actually, so this algorithm makes it very efficient because if you just focus on the MUPI side, which is the bottom row, you could have directly found the best one from the small model. And it really avoids like uh, the very costly uh, large model training. Also, it, it makes the model in general stable and also it makes the model in general more performant than the equivalent SP side thanks to this maximal update and this transparency uh, behavior. So we think it's actually quite a nice framework to combine with Kubeflow. Uh, so we, from the Kubeflow side, what we really expect is this you know, natural multi-platform execution so that as a user, you don't really have to think uh, where you're gonna run. Um, it's quite portable and flexible, so if you know how to use it on the, on the Sun one, you can very easily move to a private cloud one. You just, it's very nice, like you don't have to think about Slurm and uh, all of this stuff. <laughs> because you, you people do that. <laughs> and uh, to another extent, it means that we have an improved resource usage. It means we can more easily share you know, the results with the other experiments. We can also use ex resources that are out there and not really used uh, from uh, you know, state clouds or national laboratories and stuff like that. Uh, on the subject of the user case here, it really improves the hyperparameter search thanks to this uh, you know, auto machine learning algorithms, early stopping and all of that. So it also exposes us to some of the development being happening in the machine learning community. Uh, also, it has this nice thing that uh, you, know, you can inspect and visualize. It also makes it globally simpler to just install things and to uh, serve the model later on. And importantly for us, it's accessible to everyone in our collaboration, so it really democratizes access to this very interesting project for us. And finally, on the, we want to combine this with MUP, which is um, the, the, this uh, technique, which means that the wider model will always be more performing and makes it possible for us to use MuTransfer, which is very useful. For example, just to give you some numbers, the full embedding width model, 256, has 2.3 million parameters, and it takes 40 minutes for one epoch on two GPUs due to the size of the data set. On the small width one, which has a 10 for the parameter, we can actually do an epoch in 20 minutes with one GPU, which means that equal compute, we can do four tests of the hyperparameters on the small model for one test of the large one, which means we get a far better coverage. And I just want to conclude with the, like reminding that this is quite important. Like the sort of performance gains we have from the best hyperparameter is equivalent to the sort of performance gain we have from adopting way more complicated architecture changes or physics infused changes. And this is shown here with a very elaborate rock curves that's typical of the field where you have the BJET efficiency on the x-axis uh, and the y-axis are showing you the rejection for light and C-jets. So we, you really want to be higher there. And I'm uh, showing you this for the best model in green and the worst model in purple from the scan on the right. And you can see that in areas where we're interested, you roughly have 20 to 30% gain really from just this one parameter change. So really something important for us. And uh, I think that that's pretty much it for us. And uh, thank you for your attention. See again? There's time for one question. So, oh, yep. There's a couple, but uh, I think we only have time for one. So, I don't know. Do I? Thank you for the talk. Uh, hi, this is Abhishek from IBM Research. And I have two questions, both based on Kubernetes. So, one is how do you manage custom hardware with Kubernetes? And I think you mentioned for quite some time that you use sharing techniques. So how does Kubernetes help you in sharing your custom hardware or GPUs today? Yeah, okay, so that's a very quick question. So if you look at uh, previous talks we've given, uh, I think last year at KubeCon uh, Amsterdam, we went a bit more in detail. So um, we've been, we wrote, if you go to kubernetes.docs.cern.ch, you will find a series of blog posts about uh, sharing GPUs, and we tried and benchmarked all sorts of possibilities. So we tried anything from using uh, pure sharing of the GPUs with no uh, knowledge between the workloads and the issues with that. We also documented quite well uh, how to use NVIDIA MIG uh, and the integration with the GPU operator from NVIDIA. Uh, and we've been trying also MPS uh, for, for, for a possibility of sharing as well. So basically all our clusters have these capabilities of, uh, of 
partitioning in either physical or logical way all the GPU resources. And this is what we expose to the Kubeflow users. We, you might give, uh, get a full GPU, a fraction of a GPU, or a totally shared GPU, depending on what you're asking for. And the availability is the main thing. Uh, if we ask for a full GPU, a full A100 or H100, uh, we don't have that many, so you won't get them very fast and people fall back to the second best. Uh, I think there was another part of the question, but I don't remember. How do we manage custom hardware? So mo in most cases, the, for now, these are FPGAs. Uh, and these are just attached to the nodes and we just pass through in the same way we do for GPUs. Uh, so all the GPU access we are giving, we are not virtualizing, we're just doing PCI pass through. Uh, in some cases, partitioning it using Kubernetes, but for the nodes themselves, they, they are just doing PCI pass through. Hey, a really cool talk, Madri from Milotl. Um, wondering if you had to pick one key problem in the multi-cluster scheduling space that you alluded to, what would that be? Uh, I think I think the scheduling is is like one, the main the main issue is that there is no notion in the scheduler of multi-cluster. There are some some efforts to add this to the to the stack, uh, but there's there's little the scheduler can do right now because it doesn't know about the availability. So we tried in the past to kind of uh, go around this. So we tried something uh, a few years ago where we implemented a virtual kubelet uh, that would basically be uh, an abstraction of a full Kubernetes cluster behind so that we could advertise to the scheduler the resources from many clusters. And this was something that uh, was picked up uh, by some people. Uh, but it has drawbacks as well, so it, it is not a perfect situation. I, I would say the ideal thing would be for the scheduler somehow to be able to incorporate the resource availability of multiple clusters. Uh, I don't know exactly how we can do this. Because so availability-based scheduling is number one. I think okay, so, yeah. Thank you. I think that's it. Yep. Okay, thank you very much. And if you have more questions, just reach us.